My name is Terrence Barkin and I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council, the largest community in the world for graphene producers, researchers, application developers, and end users. We have hosted the Graphene in Healthcare and Medical Applications conference series, and the video you are about to watch is from that series. Our first speaker and presenter today is going to be Laura Line Mahe. She is an applied scientist with Team Consulting, and she will kick off today's session to give us an overview of the client side or the demand side, medical device makers and the challenges they have. And we're going to look at where graphene possibly could address some of those current challenges in the medical device diagnostics and analytics field. Thanks very much. So yeah, this talk uh, represents our um, collective view um, at Team Consulting so, uh, of the current um, healthcare uh, uh, drivers, uh, trends, opportunities, uh, and the challenges we face. Uh, it's not meant to provide direct solutions for graphene applications, uh, but rather indication of opportunities from our area of expertise, which are you know, diagnostics, drug delivery, med tech and surgical, uh, investment data that we have access to and um, conferences that we attend. It is not uh, meant to be exhaustive or a representation of their healthcare markets, it's purely to, to be indicative. So, what I will do you through today, um, I will give you some consideration about market penetration, the healthcare market drivers, user center healthcare, and then I will present what we think are uh, recent significant growth. So representing a significant opportunity for uh, technology development. Uh, and those two are uh, continue to be of uh, sustained interest. But the thing to, uh, to remember uh, with uh, trying to integrate a new technology into uh, such a heavily regulated market like um, healthcare is that there are uh, multiple factors taken into account uh, in order to assess how likely it is to, to be uh, to convince procurers and buyers uh, to take them on board uh, and how likely it is, how easy it is going to be to provide the clinical ev evidence that of their performance versus cost. The cost is one of their uh, main drivers uh, for healthcare and that has driven a lot of uh, current trends such as the shift from you know, hospitals uh, to remote uh, and um, uh, patient centered healthcare. But there are other drivers uh, such as global emergencies uh, like the pandemics, the recent pandemic or the cl climate emergency um, that are significantly uh, driving uh, which way the healthcare uh, demand is growing. Uh, but what we need are um, enabling technologies um, that are sort of at the technology readiness level needed to rapidly respond to the need, uh, which doesn't mean that um, you should not you know, research or consider long-term application because you, you don't know what you know, will be needed in, in 10 years time. And maybe the rest of the enabling technology will also uh, have changed dramatically. So one of the major trends uh, we've seen um, you know, from our client demands and, and conferences is the trend to shift uh, care from hospital where, where care is provided by trained, uh, highly skilled staff to the patient's home where care is self-provided um, and remotely monitored. So that has a significant impact on the type of technology that, that are needed. So uh, we need more uh, wearables, implantable, or energy efficient device um, and it had like, a lot of impact for example on and technology like AR and machine learning but I'm not sure that graphene will help in this area maybe wrong <laughs> The, the, um, there are three areas that we can uh, have shown uh, recent significant growth uh, in the last years. These are diagnostics and uh, digital healthcare and sustainability, which is a little bit more uh, coming our way, but we represent major opportunity for uh, problem solving, uh, essentially technical uh, and integration of uh, new technologies. So in terms of diagnostic, um, there's you know, huge evidence that uh, 
this there is a skyrocketing you know investment in Syria and this is has been exacerbated by the pandemics uh, and there you know the size of this market are are, are billions there a sort of gold cheeker in Syria uh, is to achieve a central laboratory performance uh, at lower cost um so for example um can you translate uh, molecular accurate techniques um, for, you know, carried out on perhaps a uh, not very deployable, expensive machine onto a very low cost uh, that the patient can use themselves um, and that have you know, the same accuracy? That, that is a challenge, basically. It's a significant uh, magnet opportunity um, for the, you know, the drive to, to move um, this central laboratory technique onto Earth's low cost, uh, small form factor, low cost devices, uh, you know, is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, there are room for lots, you know, lots of uh, uh, com in commerce. Uh, and also to give you an idea of the, you know, the number of, of, of mass production expectation uh, in the UK at the moment, um, the, the UK has a capacity to run, you know, 100 and 20k of lateral flu and 800k of PCR tests per day, and that's on the UK only. The technology here to, to, uh, that are very challenging, and you know we have faced uh, into trying to provide low cost, uh, perhaps single use, um, deployable, massively produced, um, sensitive devices. Our uh, temperature essentially had to um, provide uh, and a temperature than efficient manner had to deploy it uh, homogeneously had to rapidly uh, heat and cool that's very challenging um, energy production is a huge challenge uh, especially for you know possibly single use or limited use devices mixing of uh, reconstituted drugs a uh, huge challenge sensing and actuating where we want more sensor more efficient sensor, uh, low cost form factor. And one of the biggest uh, area of opportunity would be to provide more sensitive um, techniques that are perhaps not molecular techniques, uh, but uh, other techniques that don't necessarily need, uh, for example, temperature, which is energy consuming, um, but would provide better sensitivity uh, from a low sam volume sample than, for example, an optical read or visual read. I'm very thinking biofits. Uh, another experience that is uh, booming is that of sequencing, uh, again linked to um, to the pandemics. It's billions of dollars uh, market. It's growing really fast, and you know some technical challenge that we're facing is you know reducing the cost significantly, uh, providing long DNA reads. Um, and of course, you know, uh, remote uh, capabilities or so including, you know, connectivity, light words, energy, etc. One interesting application uh, actually on the side is cell therapy. Apparently there is um, a major issue with scaling up the process of growing stem cells. So graphene can solve that and that's a huge opportunity. Um, now, um, so I, took, I was talking about you know connectivity that's, that's also booming uh, and we've seen a huge increase into the measurement of digital healthcare uh, for you know real environment monitoring and patient adherence uh, democratization anything that can support this area uh, will have uh, you know uh, more opportunity to for market penetration so uh, but the, the consequence of this on technology are you know with more wearable and plantable and possibly biodegradable implants, smart dressing, blister, thin, uh, discrete electronics, but robust at the same time. Um, and so current challenges are, you know, to having a permanently located sensors uh, for, you know, a few days in a row or uh, as a shower, uh, using a minimal amount of energy uh, and that is robust and very compatible. And an interesting point is communication pairing with implant device. That's a, a very challenging area. Sustainability, that's an uh, undeniably uh, deniable trend is coming. Uh, it's not yet in their medical device regulations, but it will most likely uh, happen. Um, 
it doesn't mean that replacing all re uh, single-use device is uh, very usable because sterilization is a major issue, uh, but understand how to provide alternative material that have you know, the same mechanical performance uh, or another opportunity that is um, very huge, I think, is that of replacing um, combination material that provide um, uh, demanding barrier properties, and that's that's not solved yet. So that's a huge opportunity uh, possibly for graphene. So that's for the area of, of and sustained growth, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, steep growth. But there are other areas that you know, I still uh, have a lot of uh, uh, current opportunities for technical problem solving uh, and future exciting opportunities. So I'm thinking of you know, drug delivery, um, which means delivering drugs efficiently where it needs in a lot, and, you know, and they have a small window, uh, therapeutic window to do so. So that could be delivering small volumes uh, and the important time, delivering high viscosity drugs, um, you know, consistency of honey or three mils through the skin. Uh, important uh, issue is that of drug reconstitution for high value dose, you know, a thousand dollar dose. Uh, it's often, very often missed because it's done by the, the patient, for example, uh, and you, know, you lose uh, a high value dose. So if you can make it easier, that's a huge opportunity. Uh, another one where there are uh, large market opportunities are that of the cold chain. Uh, for example, for biologics that are high value drugs, uh, there are billions of loss every year due to uh, um, wrong manipulation, you know, wrong temperature um, control. So again, opportunity to provide more uh, effi energy efficient uh, long term sensing to, to, to indicate that it's been kept cold long enough. And finally, an uh, area where we've seen, you know, uh, some interests but are more challenging because perhaps uh, more risky and probably uh, harder to, to convince, you know, the, to provide the clinical evidence of their, um, the benefits versus the risks brought to the patients are a uh, target delivery. That's a very interesting, probably um, high opportunity in the, in the, in the future. Uh, for example, for cancer treatments, uh, brain implants, can you cross the blood, blood barrier, uh, et cetera. A minimally invasive surgical and basic procedure. Again, uh, cancer care, can you, um, can you sense tumors and provide uh, delivery of drugs uh, in situ at the same time? Or can you um, have like, uh, biocompatible implants that will deliver drug uh, in the eyes, uh, uh, in breast, um, etc. And finally, one of the last one that's you know, attracting lots of interest is you know, what is the next artificial uh, pancreas? Uh, how can we um, combine active uh, diagnosis and uh, sensing and on-demand uh, drug or therapy delivery? So to, uh, to summarize, uh, bringing uh, new te novel technologies into the market is not straightforward. Uh, it's a difficult exercise, and you, you know you have to support your um, evaluation of unmet need uh, by deep mass uh, market research, uh, key opinion leader uh, views, um, and uh, health economic assessments. Uh, there are a lot of drivers to take into account uh, where markets are going and therefore how it creates needs for uh, the next generation of, of devices. Um, the cost is always you know, one of the critical factors, global emergency and definite trend um, to shift um, care to, towards around the patient uh, in a real environment and, and at home and remote. Uh, generally, you know, we're somebody repeating that you know, we need smaller devices, more energy efficient, um, combined delivery and sensing, like in vivo, less bulky device, more sensitive technology, for example, for point of care cheap devices. Significant opportunities uh, or growth um, in the last years were diagnosis, digital healthcare, and sustainability. Uh, there is a sustained interest in. Uh, you know, all kind of urine or delivery and uh, exciting, very interesting uh, long term opportunity in you know, targeted delivery, in vivo sensing delivery, cancer research, monitoring, um, personal treatments, or uh, neurological implants, for example. Right. I, hope, uh, I hope this was useful. Uh, if you would like 
I had to, you know, not time to go in detail uh, in the subject. So if you'd like uh, more information, don't hesitate to, uh, you know, to ask for a discussion uh, outside this conference. We'd be more than happy to, 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 to chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura Line. Thank you very much for that. That's exactly what we wanted to cover is to get an overview from a perspective that you have, which is working with as an applied scientist, working with medical device companies, companies that are developing sensor technology, uh, you know, as you, as you mentioned, uh, the wide range that you covered. And it just occurs to me that there's an awful lot of opportunity for graphene to address some of these issues. I thought it was interesting. Um, you talked in particular about the need you know, for lower energy consumption, for more sensitive diagnostics, things that are um, more responsive, um, and also the heat management. Can you can you talk a little bit more about the kinds of applications where heat management is an issue? And I thought that was, if I understood correctly, that might be bringing some um, some test material to temperature in order to do the analytics. What where do you have the temperature control? Okay, right. So um, an example is bringing molecular techniques, um, you know, based on amplification of, of DNA, for example, uh, that requires um, to uh, provide heat uh, you know, for to catalyze reactions involving this um, uh, in these assays, uh, and this is a major source of uh, energy and therefore cost um, for um, an area where we want to. To provide more accuracy, but keep the cost down so that it's more affordable for you know all countries um, and more deployable. So uh, challenges are to to provide um, to, to, uh, homogeneous distribution of heat, um, to provide uh, you know 40 degrees, 60 degree heat very rapidly, and also to cool down very rapidly. So you know the tests are short; we use less energy. Um, that that was, you know, a typical example of where um, that can be a, a huge challenge uh, in, in, the, in the development of these devices. Interesting. And what 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 are the, let's say, aside from graphene, what kind of technologies are are targeted to solve that problem, or is it simply there's there's not a material yet that that can do what is needed? Um, well, the technology is to use. Um, Materials of high heat capacity and um, and you know run uh, simulation to see how heat spreads. Uh, you have to do it for a particular device because of this, the the air flows around it and also the materials uh, used. It's, okay, that's another problem actually. The um, um, the ex expansion, for example, or the different expansion of material um, that compose device. Um, the, uh, the same device, uh, and that could be different. That could lead to some faults in the, in their assays. Um, so yeah. So, that, so I assume, yeah, sorry. I assume when you say high high um, high capacity materials, uh, metallics typically are what's being used. Yeah. So for our audience, if you have any uh, any questions for Laura Line of, of what she presented or in general about you know medical applications here, feel free to use either the chat box or the Q&A dialog box, and um, we'll take your questions. So in the meantime, I do have another question for you, and this is more about kind of the, the process of getting a new material into these kind of medical devices, because of course, um, this field is highly, highly regulated. And so it depends if you have a material that's actually coming into contact with the human body or with patients versus maybe some of the diagnostic applications where it's in a device and it's not maybe as sensitive if it's being used actually in vivo or on a patient. Um, but can you talk to us a little bit you know, on the one hand, you you have gra we have graphene companies that really understand this graphene material. You know, this single layer, single atomic layer of crystalline gra uh, carbon, which has these amazing electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity properties, uh, strength, etc., which would make it a really interesting, in particular for sensing applications, make it an exciting material. And on the other hand, you have medical device companies that understand the application requirements, but 
maybe not even have heard of graphene or what they've heard of it is either out of date or they have a low understanding of it. How do we connect the dots? How do we get people with the expertise in the graphene sector together with medical device um, and, and healthcare providers who need to solve these problems? How do we connect those dots? What's the, what does that look like? So we go, you could talk to, um, to join the door, yeah, you could talk to companies like hers. Um, typically we adopt um, technology that are high readiness, but we might be able to, to advise. Um, you could talk to key opinion leaders, um, uh, regulators, uh, you know, about how much evidence you need to provide uh, in the area you would have uh, identified for uh, integration of your material. Um, yeah, just uh, talk to people that are the experts. Um, for example, in material, uh, if you wish to, if you wish to uh, replace um, an existing materials, for example, in auto injector by something with graphene, you have to for a lot of evidence that it's not uh, impacted, it's you know a five nine uh, reliability, which is you know really really high, like nine nine ninety nine point nine 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 percent as you know as uh, imposed by the FDA. So um, conferences like this are, are great as well, you know, just to put people in contact. Excellent. Um, thank yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, again, I think that's the challenge with graphene in general that we've seen is educating the end users, first of all, what the material is, how to use it, how to apply it, and then also understanding where to source it from, because we, um, you know, as the Graphene Council, we track about 300 companies that claim to produce graphene, but there are many types and forms of this material. Um, and typically what we're going to talk about today in the sessions that we have are, are, is about the monolayer or single layer uh, graphene form um, that is ideal for this kind of uh, sensing and diagnostics. Um, there is a question um, here if I read it out. So radiation, x-ray, and photon sensor progress. Is there technology readiness and, and adoption in the medical industry regarding radiation? Um, and I'm not sure, it just asks if there are any comments on where this is today. So I guess, um, the question would be either in propagation and use of radiation or in shielding. Um, I don't know if you can if you can speak a, at all about the use of radiation um, for sensing X-ray and photons. Uh, a little bit, actually. You know, in terms of uh, yeah, X-ray. Um, where we see some changes in their, um, you know, um, a, a switch from you know, big iron in hospitals to um, portable uh, more functional devices. Um, it's, uh, it's not really an area where I have a lot of insight, I think, <laughs> but we do see um, definitely some use, useful um, usefulness and some interest into more portable devices for that. So or anywhere, anywhere graphene, scanning. anywhere uh, graphene might be able to help with miniaturization and okay. reduce power consumption. Yeah, as for example, their uh, in vivo uh, lung cancer, or um, you know, any, any cancer we can access and just you know, sense uh, with imaging uh, and provide Drug delivery, um, that's definitely of interest. Excellent. Um, there's another question that kind of relates to that actually. And the question is what, what is it that allows graphene to target specific tissue types? And, and I, I have some information on that. And I want everybody to understand that Loreline is not a graphene expert, she's a medical devices expert. So she's, and, and this is why we wanted her to open our conference today is to talk about what are the challenges that the users are having. But um, Loreline, um, uh, and if you if you can't answer it, no problem, I have, I have an answer for this, but what is it do you think that allows graphene to target specific tissue types? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, no. I, I don't want to risk 
saying anything because I may have a small idea, but I'm really not sure. Um, no, no, I, I appreciate that. But this is this also illustrates why we need to have this conversation, right? We we need we, we need to take the expertise that's in two different domains and bring it together. My um my understanding, and again, I'm not I'm not a PhD or an engineer or any of this. Um, I simply run the Graphene Council. But my understanding um, with using graphene as a as a as a sensing platform for for especially for diagnostics is that the graphene works as a platform because it's highly electrically conductive and very sensitive, and then uh, molecules would be decorated on top of the graphene that would be responsive to the target, right? So you'd put an analyte on there and you would test, and you can then tune it in graphene because of its high sensitivity and its chemical inertness acts as a perfect platform. Um, and then also the level of detection can be much higher. You know, if it's parts per billion, you could get to parts per trillion, or if it's parts per million, you get the parts per billion. And we'll hear more about that, I think, from some of our other speakers about the applications they have specifically for graphene and um, graphene and um, and, and these uh, sensing devices and how it how it works. So we'll we'll get an answer to that question through some of the other presentations as well. Um, there is another question for you, Loreline, about um, applications for diabetes sensors. And I know that we've seen in many markets where, you know, instead of the the, the typical fingerprint and using a uh, finger prick rather and taking a drop of blood and a test strip, that it's moving to pervasive sensing where the, the patient would wear a device that is continuously monitoring their uh, glucose levels and, and reporting, you know, via, via an app. And and I'd like to expand the question. So first of all, um, if you could if you could and maybe we'll take this as our as our last question for you, if you could just talk a little about specifically about diabetes, which we know is a is a pervasive and growing disease, right? And in condition rather, that that um, many people around the world face. But then let's tie this into the other aspect of pervasive sensing. In other words, there's continuously monitoring of bodily functions in order to either um, anticipate adverse reactions or adverse conditions, or just in health and fitness, people want to have a greater awareness. So can you talk about those two things combined, diabetes and then pervasive sensing in this field? Um, sure, uh, a little bit. Um, I think uh, anything that can help sense glucose uh, without having to, to penetrate their, you know, the the, the um, superficial layers of the skin uh, is useful. For example, um, I think electroporation uh, is a uh, sort of non-invasive technique that um, um, do measure glucose in the interstitial food. Uh, I know that there has been some research on their um, measuring glucose uh, in the in the eye. Uh, so again. The, you know, there is an opportunity for um, you know, thin, uh, transparent, uh, electrochemical sensing uh, in this area. Excellent. And the pervasive sensing, um, you know, people have been talking about wearable devices for an extremely long time, um, and and they have not really taken hold. You know, from Google Glass to Fitbit to you know, which are which are really you know consumer products. But, but talk, you know, because we have another minute here for you. Um, what will it take to make a wearable device actually usable? Um, and I assume it's part technology, but part human behavior. Do you have any comments on that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, or it has to be simple. Or it has to be um, disaster not to disturb um, the routine of the patients. Um, starts us to promote adherence, uh, not painful. Um, so everything that promotes you know, seamless transfer of data if it's connected or a uh, limited uh, in invasion of day-to-day uh, -day life will promote the wear of, of, the, of the wearable on, our, on the longer term periods and therefore provide, for example, you know, better data, uh, better care uh, as well in terms of uh, drug delivery. Excellent. Yeah, I think durability is one of those as well, right? Especially if it's in a textile, it has to be able to survive washing yeah. and wear and all that stuff. Yeah, that, that, that's a big one, sorry. And um, for 
for example, where a, a common issue is how to provide waterproofness and permanent location uh, for these devices uh, so that you know they don't need to remove it, put it back. Or in the case of textile, uh, an interesting problem is to, to provide uh, um, edge, edge tracks robustness um, to, to chemical uh, uh, attacks or even you know mechanical wear. Excellent. And with that, I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, finish this session. Loreline, I want to thank you so much for giving your perspective.